in this lecture, we're going to talk about um, psychoanalytic theories on personality. So we're going to look at mostly at Sigmund Freud and the main ideas that he's contributing to uh, this field. So Freud is the first and certainly the most influential uh, psychologist who talks about personality. And he subscribes to this idea of psychodynamic or psychoanalytic <clears throat> psychology. And so Freud believes that the personality can be divided into, it can be divided kind of in a different, a number of different ways. But first he looks at um, the conscious and the unconscious. And Freud's a big believer in the unconscious. And uh, he argues that the unconscious, thought, the unconscious mind plays a major role in behavior. But thoughts in the unconscious, according to Freud, are not readily accessible. So we can't really uh, get to that information. So even though it plays a huge role, we can't get to it. It just kind of is sort of existing in the back. Um, he argues that this is where our motivation and drives come from. And uh, that it really pushes all that we do. And this is going to shape up to another uh, component of Freudian thinking in a little bit. Uh, but even though Freud argues that our unconscious is impossible to bring to our thoughts and we can't really know what's going on, he does suggest that there are some things that give us a glimpse into our unconscious. Uh, things like a slip of the tongue, known as a Freudian slip, when you accidentally say something you don't mean to say, um, but it may reveal a deeper desire, according to Freud at least. And then he also argues that the latent content of your dreams may be indicative of your innermost desires and what you really want, even though you're not necessarily overtly saying that's what you want, um, that the dreams are kind of a window into the unconscious. Then Freud argues for something called the conscious, which is <clears throat> things you are thinking about right now, uh, and it stores that information there. And then this third component is what he calls the preconscious, And that's concepts and thoughts and ideas that are not currently being thought about, but are readily accessible. And so these preconscious thoughts are things that we can access if we need to, but are not always there uh, in the forefront because we have limited space that we can think about. And so that sort of hides away in the back. <clears throat> Freud also is a big pioneer and big believer in dream analysis. And he thinks that dreams are a window into the unconscious mind and that we can use our dreams to better understand uh, what our primal desires are, what we really want in our lives. And so he creates a list of Freudian symbols uh, that go along with that. And Freud is notorious for his uh, over-sexuality. And so uh, that shows up really in his, uh, in his dreams and his symbols of his dreams. So... Uh, he thinks that items in his dreams represent other items or events in the unconscious. So his examples are uh, knives, spears, and other sharp weapons symbolize male genitalia. Uh, boxes, ships, and other vessels represent female genitalia. And so he argues that those are then representative of your innate desires in your unconscious. He then splits the mind into kind of three separate components. The id, the ego, and the superego. And this is probably what Freud is most known for. Um, he argues that the id is the source of all your kind of energy and your drive. That is where your basic human needs uh, are stored and your basic human desires. And the id, he argues, operates on a pleasure principle, which is the idea that you want to maximize pleasure while minimizing pain. So everything that the id is striving to do is maximize pleasure. And that is then in contrast with the superego. And the superego is like, rules, morals, and obligations. It is the opposite of the id um, in terms of its desires because it's trying to it's trying to really constrain what you do while the id is just telling you enjoy, 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 enjoy. And so there's some struggle there. And that struggle is represented by the ego, which allows a person to function in their environment and be logical. Um, it operates on what's called the reality principle, and that says that uh, a set of desires can only be satisfied if the means to satisfy them exists and is available. So what your id wants, it needs to exist and be available in order for your body to get them. And so the ego works as kind of the intermediary, the go-between 
the deal maker uh, between the ego and the, uh, I'm sorry, the super ego and the id. Uh, Freud says that nonstop there is uh, conflict between the id and the super ego. And uh, the ego deals with this complex conflict using various mechanisms. Um, <clears throat> these con defense mechanisms do serve a useful purpose in helping reduce tension and maintain healthy outlooks. But um, sometimes this requires self-deception to maintain this healthy outlook. And so sometimes this, uh, these defense mechanisms can get over the top and can turn out to be very bad. Uh, and so we'll look at some of them. And these are, these are and should be familiar. Uh, repression, displacement, reaction formation, compensation, rationalization, digression, denial, and sublimation. And repression is when you, are, you don't want to deal with things. Memories bring too much pain, too much anxiety, or whatever it may be. And so you shove them back down in the unconscious because remember that is the place where you cannot think about or access information. So you send them back into the unconscious. Displacement is when we direct our anger away from what we're really angry at and lash out at something else. Um, and so you'll see this often with people lashing out at friends when they're really angry at their parents or lashing out at a spouse when they're really mad at work or whatever it may be. And the reaction formation is the ego doing, um, it's taking a desire that you have that is disturbing and redirecting it in a way that is more socially acceptable. So again, it's, it's balancing between that id and that super ego. Uh, compensation is making up for failures in one area uh, by trying to be successful in another or focusing in on what you're good at. We've all seen rationalization. It's when we come up with excuses to justify behavior that is irrational or inappropriate. It's trying to create logical excuses for our overly emotional um, or irrational behaviors. Regression involves reverting back to childish behavior. Denial is when we refuse to accept unwanted uh, beliefs or actions. We just refuse to acknowledge that something could be true. Uh, because if we can deny it, if we can deny its existence, then we'll be better off. And then sublimation is channeling or redirecting of feelings to more socially acceptable outlooks. Uh, and so it's taking those desires that you have and pushing them in a way uh, that society will accept um, as not being too over the top. So Freud is followed up by Carl Jung, who argues that the mind has pairs of opposing forces, and uh, this conflict, uh, he follows in Freud's steps argument that there's conflict. And so he says each person has persona, um, and that is a mask that's put on for the outside world, what other people see. And then a shadow, which is the deep, passionate inner self, the true self, in many ways, representing a lot of what the id is, um, it, to Freud's thinking. He also argues for each side having an anima and an animus, female and male sides to the personality. And again, Jung is way ahead of his time in understanding that gender uh, spectrum idea. And then he says that all of these forces are balanced out by something he calls the self. So not the ego, but the self. So in many ways, it looks a lot like Freud, but he does a few different changes here and there. Uh, in order to differentiate himself and kind of build upon Freud's ideas. And so Jung is most famous for uh, dividing the unconscious slightly different than Freud. He says that each person has two different unconscious. Their personal unconscious, that is repressed memories and clusters of thought, things that we have that we've uh, experienced in our own individual lives and how that affects us. And then what he calls the collective unconscious, which is behavior and memory that's common to all humans. Uh, passed down from our ancient ancestors, and he sees this through a lot of anthropology, a lot of different cultural things, that cultures paint things the same way, have common origin stories, have similar myths, and have different, uh, like, similar ways of behaving. So what he says is that there is some collective unconscious that is, uh, affects all of us. And these he calls um, archetypes. These are behaviors and memories that live in this collective unconscious. Things that tell us how to behave as human beings and that are similar across cultures and across generations. Another psychodynamic uh, psychologist dealing with personality is Alfred Adler. And he believes that uh, childhood is a crucial formative period. Uh, and that all children develop feelings of inferiority because of size or competence or size and competence, really. It's those two combinations, either they don't feel like they're good enough at something or they don't feel like they're big enough at something. 
And so uh, Adler says that people spend the rest of their lives trying to overcome this inferiority. And uh, this is where you see this struggle, this conflict. So he defines this conflict a little bit differently than Freud and uh, Jung would have. But he also uh, sees conflict as existing. And Adler says that the best way to overcome this inferiority is to create a lifestyle that contributes to society, to be a functioning member of society uh, that he calls a lifestyle of social interest. And so making society matter or making your life matter to society. And if you fail to do that, this can lead to an inferiority complex where you always feel like you're not good enough. And Adler warns that's a very dangerous place to be.